Greetings from St. Andrew's, the Apostle Catholic Church. Wherever you may be, we are happy you have joined us for Mass today. We invite you to participate however you are able, whether by following along with the readings on the USCCB website, or joining in the responses and songs in the worship aid. Today we celebrate the fourth Sunday of Lent. This would be an ideal time to open the worship aid you received in the recent email.
Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> o God, who through your word reconciled the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, grant that with prompt devotion and eager faith, we may hasten toward the solemn celebrations to come. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for I have chosen my king from among his sons. As Jesse and his sons came to the sacrifice, Samuel looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is here before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not judge from his appearance or from his lofty stature, because I have rejected him. Not as man sees does God see. Because man sees the appearance, but the Lord looks into the heart. In the same way, Jesse presented seven sons before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any one of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? Jesse replied, There is still the youngest who is tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send for him. We will not begin the sacrificial banquet until he arrives here. Jesse sent and had the young man brought to them. He was ruddy, a youth handsome to behold, and making a splendid appearance. The Lord said, There, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel, with the horn of oil in hand, anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, you were once darkness, but now you are a light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the fruitless works of darkness, rather expose them, for it is shameful even to mention the things done by them in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Sabbath. 
of his objective. If a man is a sinner, how can he perform works like these? They were sharply divided over him. Then they addressed the blind man again. Since it was your eyes he opened, what do you have to say about him? He's a prophet. The religious leaders refused to believe they had, that he had really been born blind and had begun to see, until they summoned the parents of this man who now could see. Is this your son? And if so, do you attest that he was blind at birth? How do you account for the fact that he can now see? His parents answered, We know this is our son, and we know he was blind at birth. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we have no idea. Ask him. He is old enough to speak for himself. His parents answered in this fashion because they were afraid of the religious leaders, who had already agreed among themselves that anyone who acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God. First of all, we know this man is a sinner. I would not know whether he is a sinner or not. I know this much. I was blind before, now I can see. They persisted. Just what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I have told you once, but you would not listen to me. Why do you want to hear it all over again? Do not tell me you want to become his disciples too. You are the one who is that man's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we have no idea where this man comes from. in this virtual world. 
I miss you. I miss celebrating Mass with you. We all miss having you here at the church and on campus. Now, if this feels a bit weird to you, it really feels weird to me. I've never preached to an empty church before, although some people have said I've emptied some. <laughs> there are just enough of us here to be able to offer this service to you. I'm grateful to all of them for their dedication in trying to bring this prayer moment to you at this time. I also realized this week with some horror that you now have the power over me you have never had before. You can turn me off. <laughs> but all the good people who love Jesus will stay tuned. But we're trying to make this a helpful moment of prayer, hope, and consolation in a difficult time. I do have a joke. I thought we probably especially needed one right now. The man was flying from Seattle to San Francisco. The plane made a stop in Sacramento. Many of the passengers got off to stretch their legs. Everyone got off the plane except one gentleman who was blind. His seeing-eye dog lay quietly underneath the seats in front of him. The man was obviously a regular on the flight because the pilot actually addressed him by name. Keith, we're in Sacramento for almost an hour. Would you like to get off and stretch your legs? No thanks, but maybe my dog would. So now get the picture and picture the reaction of the passengers. The pilot was wearing sunglasses, and he came off the airplane through the boarding lounge, led by a seeing-eye dog. But the best part of all was a lady in the boarding lounge who said, wow, they really do make these planes to fly by themselves. And yes, you're stuck with three points, but you can turn me off if you get sick of it. And while I can't see, just remember that God is watching. First, the gospel and a little bit of theological background. Jesus is in Jerusalem to celebrate a feast called Tabernacles. It was an autumn festival where people built little tabernacles, booths, or tents to recall the time that they lived in tents in the years they wandered in the wilderness prior to their arrival in the Promised Land. The days and nights of the festival were filled with singing, dancing, and ceremonies, and during which some of them, the priests carried water from the pool of Siloam to the temple. Tabernacles was also a feast of lights. There were four giant menorahs erected in the temple, so that as the Jewish Mishnah records, there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that did not reflect this light. So it's easy to see the connection to Jesus as the light of the world, which is one of Jesus' titles in this Gospel of John. The motif of washing leading to sight is an anticipation of baptism at the Easter Vigil for our elect. They'll be celebrating a second scrutiny on, in churches throughout the world this day. This rite is part of the process of purification to prepare the elect for the water bath of baptism. The story of the blind man also reminds us all that this journey into Christ will involve persecution and difficulty. Notice that once the blind man receives his sight, he's suddenly confronted, confronted by a world that does not know Christ. And so as he is berated and questioned by Jewish officials, his insight into who this person of Jesus is grows. So notice that his description moved from the man Jesus to prophet, to worshiper of God, and finally to a confession of Jesus as the Son of Man. So it's almost like two elevators passing up and down. The blind man's accusers are descending into spiritual blindness, and he moves up toward the true light that comes from Christ. The narrative does not simply contrast the blind man with those who see, because the blind man remains faithful under attack. This offers to John's, at that time, persecuted community a model for their own faithful and courageous witness. And I think it's probably a good lesson for us now during this time of the coronavirus. We're called to remain faithful. Remain faithful, remain steadfast in the midst of a difficult time. This is where we show the world that we are believers in Jesus Christ. There's a lot of rich symbolism here as well. 
Jesus mixes saliva and clay, saliva and the earth. Saint Irenaeus of Lyon wrote that Jesus was making clear that this was the same hand of God through which man was formed from the earth, from clay. Clay or earth should immediately ring a biblical bell for us. Think Adam and Eve. Remember, John's Gospel begins with the phrase from the opening of the book of Genesis, in the beginning. So here we are, have a new creation that's being made in this blind man, just as in the beginning there was the first creation work of God in creating Adam and Eve. So again, almost everything in John's Gospel is more than what it initially appears. The baptismal symbolism of the, of the whole text really just screams out at us. We are told that Siloam means sent. Jesus is the one sent. All of us who are baptized are people who are sent. So second, this story of a man coming to sight becomes a great symbol of our own coming to insight. Insight is the deeper seeing that following Christ should entail. It means that we are able to begin to see into the deeper meaning of things, the deeper reality that underlines it all. It is the God perspective that so easily can elude us in our overly busy lives. Now that we have to take a break, we have an opportunity for us to deepen our insight. But insight is always there for those who are open to claim it. Without insight, we are perpetually the emperor with no clothes. Without insight, we end up living empty lives that are mostly just self-serving. They're just too much about us. Insight is what we get when we look inside, when we get a glimpse, a clue of what really is going on. It can sometimes surprise us what we find within our own hearts. How good we can be, as well as how evil we can be. But insight leads to our best self and being the person that we know deep down we are called to be. So how do we get this deeper insight? There are lots of ways, but prayer is one of the most important parts. And I don't mean anything monkish. At least 10 minutes a day, a simple, help me, O oh Lord, to see your path in this, or open my eyes, Lord, that I might see this as you see it. It also means that we have to pay attention. To recall, maybe at the end of every day, what happened to us? What did we do? Who did we interact with? And how did we act? What made us happy, sad, angry, overwhelmed, confused, surprised? Because anything that moves us bears divine insight. These deeper experiences, that really happen to us on an almost daily basis are like a cosmic little tap or poke from God, sometimes kind of playful, sometimes really like a punch in the gut, sometimes just a still, small voice, but the voice of God nevertheless. There is a lot of divine insight to be found in the ordinary manner of our daily lives. Divine insight reminds us that if one bush can light up, any bush can catch fire, anywhere, anytime. Every place we stand is holy ground. That includes our kitchen, our cubicles, our computers as we're learning online, or working from home, rocking a baby to sleep, huddled together as a family watching this Mass. I'm sure that there is a ton of insight, divine insight, into the reality of a world pandemic. It's waiting to be gleaned as we navigate through something that probably none of us have ever experienced before. And so we need to pay particularly close attention, prayerful attention. We need to ponder, we need to stop, to take stock. Because any people, events, Choices that bring out the best or the worst in us, the good twin and the evil twin, these are potential insight givers. Our gut feelings will let us know how well we're doing, and if we're open, they'll nag us until we get the message that God wants to give us. 
the clue we need to see more clearly, to love more dearly, follow more nearly, as the old song says. For those of us who have eyes to see, insight comes from the best and the worst parts of any given day. Because God has just as much to say to us when good things happen as He does when bad things happen to us. Good news and bad news both tend to be big bearers of divine insight. This is the meaning of the Paschal Mystery, the center of our faith. It's dying and rising. It's suffering and triumph. It's all one piece. And it's all packed full with the presence of God. Coronavirus and all. Shortly before I left for the seminary, at my high school graduation, I was given a holy card from a nun that said, God writes straight with crooked lines. I thought maybe she's trying to tell me I shouldn't be going to seminary. Maybe I'm one of God's crooked lines. But she had always been a very encouraging presence in my life, so I figured this was not meant as in a negative way. And then I sort of realized we're all God's crooked lines. By the grace of God, all the disappointments, the failures, the mistakes, the tragedies, they become part of the winding path of our lives. Given as turning points, loaded with divine insight, if we simply are open enough to see. The best and the happiest times are no less insightful just because they feel so good. During the best times, our primary job is to become grateful, humble, and generous. Then we can party hard. Thank God that goodness is sometimes so tangible, we feel it. But the kind of thanks that our gratitude should provoke is what moves us to be kind, to be just, to be forgiving and generous. We who have been so blessed should in turn be a blessing to others. Our world is desperately in need of global sharing. If we're not in that picture, we need to get ourselves into it ASAP. Share, 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 share what we have been given. It all comes from God. What we do with what we get is always loaded with divine insight. It's also, we're told, the stuff of final judgments. And it's in everybody's best interest to pay undivided attention to all of it, especially those insights that lead us to discover what enough is. It's a pity so few in our world seem to know that. But we do not want to be among them as followers of Christ. But in the end, the deepest insight of all is love. My third point. Jesus made love the heart of his teaching. Love of his Father, love of our neighbor. And I keep wondering, how could something so simple be so greatly missed in our world? And I think it's because there is that much blindness. And why the story of the blind man is so important for us to hear. Maybe this virus will help us to open our eyes. To realign ourselves with love, with service, with generosity, with community, caring for one another, with Christ. We all love to fall in love. It's the greatest experience in the world. It's exciting to discover that there's somebody out there who believes that he or she couldn't possibly be happy without us. And to make such a difference in somebody's life is to give our lives meaning. Really, fame probably is just this on a larger scale. To believe that the world could not possibly survive without our presence. And being happy, it's ultimately just the byproduct of finding meaning in our lives. Without a sense that we make a difference, I doubt any of, it, any of us could ever be happy. So let's be about love. This is the deepest insight, the one that removes blindness. Take time every day for a few moments with God. Working from home, being out of school, should certainly give us a lot more time and opportunity. Please let's not waste it by endlessly checking on updates on the number of new cases in what counties and countries. It's going to play it out however it's going to be played out. We're not going to be able to do anything by endlessly obsessing over it. We also could just tell God every day that we love Him, 
And that we're grateful that He loves us and He's with us through this. That alone would be a great prayer. And we need to tell God thanks, even in a time of difficulty. You know, God might just like a word of thanks for all the things He gives to us every single day that we take for granted. Maybe after sunset we could just say, nice job God, that was a really particularly fine beauty you did again today. And then tell all the people you're interacting with that you love them. Now that the whole family are actually home for an entire day, a lot of families, we might be getting on one another's nerves. Maybe it's not happening in your family, but you may have heard rumors about it happening in other families. But just tell your family that you love them. Spouse, children, parents, friends, your co-workers. It's not mushy. It's real. It's true. It's deep. And this leads to God, who is love. If we've read any of the transcripts of the final calls from the burning Twin Towers in 9-11, every one of them was about the exact same thing. Everybody was calling everybody they knew to tell them goodbye. And how much they loved them. They didn't ask about their portfolios. They didn't say, how's the new kitchen coming along? They simply told people that they loved them as they said goodbye. So let's be about love. Simply love. And we will see as that blind man once saw. As clearly as the angels. As clearly as God himself. Let the church say amen. And amen. Hope to see you virtually again. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one, one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light and light. True God, true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the body. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate in the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified by the conscious body. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us offer our petitions. For the church, that it may listen to and proclaim your word, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in authority, that they may listen to those in their care, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Jeremiah, Armando, and all the elect preparing to receive the sacraments during the Easter season, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in our own community who would benefit from a good word of love, that they may hear it, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick, including Jews, Sila, and all who are affected by the coronavirus, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the prayers in our book of intentions, for those who have asked for our prayers, and for the prayers of all here, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Peter Emmett, for whom this Mass is offered, and for all who have died, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, you have given us infinitely more than we could ask for, for even a Mass. Hear our prayers, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
pray, sisters and brothers, that this our sacrifice may become acceptable to God, our loving Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the grace and glory of his name. For our good and the Lord's fathers of the church. We place before you with joy our offerings, which bring eternal remedy, O Lord, praying that we may both faithfully revere them and present them to you as is fitting for the salvation of all the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ the Lord. By the mystery of the Incarnation, He has led the human race that walked in darkness into the radiance of the faith that has brought those born in slavery to sin through the waters of regeneration to make us your adopted children. And so with angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your glory is without end we acclaim. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety, as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your friends, I leave you peace. Peace is my gift to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Grant to us the peace, the unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit.
pray. O God, who enlighten everyone who comes into this world, illuminate our hearts with the splendor of your grace, that we may always ponder what is worthy and pleasing to you, and love you in all sincerity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for coming, and thank you for tuning in. Go in peace. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.